is going on to all my you fans out there and welcome back to the channel today we are here to break down and review you season four part one episode one which is titled joe takes a holiday full spoilers ahead as we're introduced to this new american professor teaching short stories as a fan of this series this is the perfect job for joe aka william who goes by the name of jonathan moore which we actually get the origin of where that name comes from a little bit later in this episode we're introduced to one of the many new cast members of this new season who goes by the name of malcolm who's also a professor but also an a-hole malcolm really wants to learn more about jonathan and wants to hang out with him more but we see that jonathan's been avoiding him and he's also not a fan of him and malcolm we got a lot to discuss about him a little bit later as as we see Jonathan he's just right at home at London he even says that the Brits are the most literary people on earth and they respect their books and we know how much Joe loves books and respects books so he goes on to say that the LA suburban lifestyle was hell for him and that London once again is just the perfect place for him he just needs this this place to be to let his mind go let his past go and he needs this much needed holiday as he's adjusting to his new life and his new neighborhood which is really cut right out of a Hugh Grant movie movie we see Jonathan says he never I mean never wants to fall in love he doesn't want to get involved in people's life he just wants to focus on his books well that's shortly lived because we see that he's living across the street from Malcolm who also lives with his girlfriend who goes by the name of Kate and I'm telling y'all right now I have a feeling that she's going to be very important to this new season and yeah y'all remember two seconds ago how Jonathan said that he won't be involved in people's lives well that didn't last long because he is now invested in learning more about Kate Kate. Now, we're going to kind of put this storyline aside and kind of focus on the flashbacks here for a second. And in the flashbacks in this premiere episode, we see Joe is searching for Marianne and he finds her in France, which he learns that she was actually going to London for this art show, which explains why Jonathan found his way to London because he was actually looking for Marianne. Now, he does find her and let me know in the comments for a brief second there, she seemed to smile, but that also could just be made up in Jonathan's head she eventually runs from him he catches her and they have a conversation now within this conversation she's very upfront with him you're a murderer you killed my ex-husband you killed your wife and I'm honestly afraid for my life right now now Joe is trying to play it smooth he tells her I'm not a murderer and I'm not a murderer and I'm gonna prove I'm not a murderer he lets her go now if you've seen obviously the previous three seasons this is only what the really the second time he's let a woman go the first time being Jenna Ortega's character which I'm telling y'all right now fingers crossed I really do hope that they found a way to implement her in this new season because obviously she knows about Joe, but also she's a mega star and I'm a big fan of hers. But as I digress, we see that he lets her go. And the question I have for you all, will that come back to bite him in the ass a little bit later as we see this mysterious individual is watching him? Now, we find out that this mysterious person goes by the name of Elliot. What a great name. He is uh, hired by Ray Quinn and he's hired to actually kill Joe. But we see Elliot has plans of his own and he actually wants to work and exploit Joe and this is where we see that it is Elliot that is actually the one responsible for giving him the Jonathan profile but there's a catch with this new lifestyle this new name this new visa passport and everything like that in order to make this seem as Joe is dead he has to go along with tying up loose ends that loose end being Marianne and we see Elliot is telling him he must kill her so we're going to get back to that in a second here, but kind of focusing on this flashback sequence. Me personally, I'm very curious to see how the Quinn's going to play into this new season, whether that's Dottie or obviously the husband. But more importantly, Henry, do you all think that we're going to get some scenes or, or get moments of Henry within this new season? Let me know your thoughts on that. And again, we'll get back to the flashback sequence when we break down the ending of this episode. But meanwhile, we see Kate is mugged, but Jonathan can't resist to help her, which he eventually does. But he does request that aim is not brought up in the police report for obvious reasons. Saving Kate's life, Malcolm insists that Jonathan go with them to the most exclusive club in Soho where he meets all these new privileged individuals so breaking down these new characters we have Penelope who's an influencer we meet her boyfriend who goes by the name of Adam who's actually the owner of this particular hottest exclusive club 
in Soho. We meet a Nigerian princess who goes by the name of Blessing. We have Simon and Sophie Sue. Simon's an artist and they both come from money as well as Sophie. She's also an influencer. And then we also have like kind of secondary characters, Connie and Gemma, which we don't learn too much about, but I'm sure we will in the future episodes. But one character that I want to talk about for a second, he goes by the name of Reese. Now, Reese is a, a book writer. He's also the son of a duke. And he seems to have this shared familiarity with Joe and his backstory. So he's someone that Joe, or I should say Jonathan, connects with in this episode. And I have my eye on him. Let me know if you guys are suspicious about Reese in the comments. But as we see during this scene, I want to focus on two characters. And that is Simon and Sophie. We see when Simon is introduced to Jonathan, I found it interesting that he says... I have enough friends, but come back when one of them is dead. And he looks directly at Malcolm when he says that. And literally seconds later, when we are introduced to Sophie, Malcolm calls her a sociopath. And she nicely says to him to go screw himself and that she hopes that he dies. That is two members of the same family that wants to see Malcolm dead. And Jonathan notices that. I have my eyes on those two right now. And we'll talk about them here in a second. But Jonathan is given this, this alcohol. He's kind of going on this trippy journey. And we see Malcolm tells him that he should let the woman go who broke his heart and move on. And we see Jonathan isn't a fan of what he's saying there, which might lead to him thinking to what happens to Malcolm a little bit later. As we see him learning little bits and pieces of these new characters, and he also kind of gives a little bit of his backstory what brought him to London. But it's important to point out another scene here, and I'm talking about Sophie. She tells Jonathan the following. Did he tell you he's royal adjacent? He dated the Middletons, and Malcolm is a liar. So again, this is pointing towards a member of the Sue family isn't a fan of Malcolm. And to me, right now, they're kind of my prime suspects because they kind of remind me of this kind of brother and sister duo, kind of like 40 in love. We see Jonathan eventually makes it back home, but he passes out. He barely remembers what happens the night before, but he wakes up to finding a dead body in his flat and there's no other than Malcolm with a knife in his chest, but also he has a finger missing, which I found to be very interesting. So you can tell how much Jonathan hated Malcolm because he literally didn't even flinch, didn't bat an eye. He didn't even seem to care that he had a dead body in Malcolm's body in his house. He really didn't like him, but I couldn't help, if I'm being honest with you, you all to feel like this has kind of felt familiar. It kind of reminded me a little bit of season two where Joe believed that he had killed Delilah. So it kind of reminded me of that sequence there. As we see, Jonathan believes that he did this because of course he hated Malcolm and he believes that he probably said something like when he was talking about Marianne earlier that that's probably what led him to dying. But he notices that he's missing that finger and that finger seemed to have a pretty important ring on it. So my question is, who took this ring and is it was it some type of trophy for this individual as we see Jonathan's going back to his old ways and now he has to find a way to get rid of the body as we cut to the scene of Cardi B playing in the background and Jonathan has a half of a football game to get rid of this body and we get one of the more bloodier scenes that we've seen so far in this entire series as we fast forward to him getting rid of the body he's having this conversation with Reese as he's giving Jonathan words of encouragement to face his problems and to embrace everything for this road of redemption which again Jonathan still believes he's a good guy all the things he did was for the right cause and again Reese being the one to tell him that makes me believe that Reese also has a dark past and he had to find his way to redemption and I can't wait to see what those moments were. As we wrap up this first episode, we end with seeing Jonathan going back to that flashback. He is tasked with killing Marianne. Does he do it? Of course he doesn't do it. He loves her, but he does take her necklace and he takes a picture of it, pretending to have had killed her to give it proof to Elliot. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all. If Elliot is some type of badass hitman, just taking a simple picture of someone's necklace seems to be a very silly way to confirm you killed someone. So I am to believe Elliot won't believe him. He's going to probably try to attempt to kill Marianne. And I think that might be a plot that we can explore. Let me know your thoughts on that. As we end with seeing Kate, who is slightly concerned that Malcolm is missing, but she also doesn't seem that concerned because it seems like that's something that he does on a regular. As she invites Jonathan to this dinner date, which Penelope actually wanted to see Jonathan there because they had a very good connection. And we see Kate does reveal to Jonathan that she didn't tell the police that she was helped out by him in the mugging. As Jonathan arrives to the party, he receives a message from a very high security app from a stranger. And this stranger is impressed by his actions. And they go ahead and kind of reveal themselves as 
if not the killer, they were probably involved with the killing of Malcolm, who we see wanted to put the blame on Jonathan. So we end the episode at the table with all the other privileged new characters, and Jonathan puts the question out there, who was the killer? Episode 2, titled Portrait of an Artist. We open the episode with the question that we were posed with at the end of episode one, which was, who killed Malcolm? We see Jonathan looking across the table at all these potential killers. As we see Adam jokingly warning Jonathan about murdering him if he steals the spotlight after giving some kind words to Simon on this special occasion. Now, going back to my thoughts in episode one, you all know Adam was definitely one of my number one suspects. Him and Penelope probably working together as this kind of power couple sort of kind of it would have happened if love and joe stayed together but we're gonna learn a lot about adam in this episode one thing in particular that i uh didn't care to know about but we'll talk about that later as we go back to jonathan's home he has an invitation there that was given to him by kate now kate seems to be on his radar now and throughout this episode we're watching jonathan kind of pick and choose who he believes the murderer is which leads him to dive into these books about murder mysteries and hopes to study the killer's next move now we know as an audience joe you're a killer man so he kind of knows certain things but he's never met someone that's kind of leaving it as a mystery which leads him to talking to nadia now i didn't really talk too much about nadia in my episode one breakdown because there wasn't a ton from her but this episode was the complete opposite she is the perfect individual to kind of look into these murder mysteries and she knows all the tropes she tells jonathan number one there's no coincidences number two motives tend to all points towards three things sex money and revenge and number three the first suspect tends to be the next victim which is very key now with all this information in mind he thinks elliot might be the lead suspect now it was just so funny seeing jonathan going back and forth wait it's kate it's adam now it's elliot but we get this scene here with elliot as he seems to want to move past this and he wants to leave his hit jobs behind him and he's living this new life now but let's talk about about this for a hot second Elliot he's gonna return right and also the involvement with the Quins after losing 40 and then losing their daughter and knowing where their grandson Henry is I am to believe that Elliot will come back some way somehow at least I hope so because that would seem like a waste of a character but also I believe the Quins are gonna still be involved but that's just my working theory for now but talking a little bit about Nadia, if you're a Scream fan like I am, doesn't Nadia kind of remind you all of Randy because she is just like so knowledgeable about all these things? But again, I definitely have my suspicions on her, but not necessarily maybe being the murderer, but in particularly her relationship that she has with Malcolm. As we see a new message coming in taunting Jonathan, he knows that this, or to say he or she knows that Jonathan isn't Professor and Jonathan isn't even their real name. But the question is, who will figure out the other person's true identity first? And it's kind of a ticking time bomb that we get throughout this episode. But as we see, Jonathan and Penelope had shared some secrets together the other night, and she really has taken a liking to him. She's really interested in making him a friend as they offer him a free outfit for Simon's big show that he's having later in this episode. So one of the themes so far in this episode that we can clearly see, everyone hated Malcolm. And also, Malcolm seems to have have dirt on everyone which might have led to his death which leads Jonathan to stealing a key to Malcolm's office in which he finds the secrets and the dirt that Malcolm had on others and remember money was a key thing that Nadia mentioned which funny enough speaking of Nadia she happens to just be coming around the office kind of late hours which again makes me think that there might have been a relationship established between Nadia and Malcolm and if you even remember in episode one Malcolm kind of joked around about having relationships with his students so again Nadia is someone that we will be focusing on but time to start the spine as we see Jonathan kind of checking off these potential other killers right now he's checking off Gemma and also Princess who goes by the name of Blessings they're kind of low on his list but he's still circling on Adam he calls him a charming bully and he mentions that Adam's name was actually brought up in that diary that was found in Malcolm's office. As we see, secrets are being revealed. And like I mentioned up top, there's some things I didn't want to learn about with Adam, this being one of them. 
he has a fetish, and that is having people pee on him, giving him a golden shower. As we see, Vix catches Jonathan spying on him doing this, and we see Jonathan making up this lie about researching books on the rich. Vic doesn't buy it, but he lets him go after he takes the money that we saw Jonathan find in Malcolm's office, and he tells Jonathan, let's just pretend you have amnesia and you didn't see anything happen. This makes me believe that Vic knows everything about all these privileged people. He probably knows all their deepest and darkest secrets. So I am to believe that not Vic is the killer, but he's someone that would probably be beneficial to learning more information about if I was Jonathan. Now, in this part of the episode, all the signs are pointing towards Adam as the motives are starting to line up that Malcolm actually knew about his secret fetish as he wrote this in his journal. But we know it just seems too easy, right? After having this conversation with Adam, that is the case it is confirmed that he's kind of going back to square one because adam kind of warns him that you shouldn't get into sharing your private business with malcolm so right now like i said adam isn't the main suspect at least for now but speaking of business random woman walks into a facility where his art show is being held and it's actually the same woman that let joe sneak into the back now she's there to embarrass simon in front of everyone she throws red paint on the work she throws paint on him and she yells to everyone tell them that you're a fake as she gets escorted out by Vic. Now, quick on his feet, we see Simon pretends that this was all part of his show, but when Kate is aware of the situation that he might be a fraud, and this is where Jonathan steps in and wants to help her find this woman. Now, we end up meeting this individual who goes by the name of Blue. Now, Blue was actually an assistant of Simon, but she also was the person behind his work. Now, she tells him a little bit more information that this isn't the first time he's done this. He's done this to other girls, and he not only lies and, and kind of has them be forgotten about, but he also gets them addicted to drugs, and this is where we see Kate walks off. She writes her a check for I believe three thousand dollars see that jonathan stays behind and this is where he learned that malcolm actually came to her first in hopes to expose simon and some of his other friends before he ended up getting killed now of course no one knows that malcolm is dead except for jonathan now as the plot thickens in my comments on episode one when we remember that simon said that oh if you want to be a friend maybe one of our other friends have to be killed that's starting to gain a little bit of traction but uh my theory on simon being involved is going to be derailed and debunked pretty soon not a minute your number one suspect tends to be your next victim and surprise surprise Simon he ends up getting killed by Jonathan Stalker and probably the person that's responsible for killing Malcolm as well as he his MO seems to be leaving a knife in the victim's chest but also taking a piece of their body episode one it was Malcolm Feeniger now in episode two it's the ear so what is this adding up to? It seems to be pointing towards some type of message. I don't know if you use the finger analogy. Maybe Malcolm was pointing the fingers at people and not taking responsibility in the ear being like Simon's listening or stealing people's ideas. That's kind of where my head's at now. As we cut to the scene of seeing Simon's quote unquote closest friends not really caring that he's dead. This leads us to a really interesting scene where we see Jonathan talking to Reese as he's somewhat mourning Simon, which again goes back to my comments in episode one. He doesn't seem to fit in with his crew, and even Jonathan brings it up here. But the question is, is Reese being genuine? I really am suspicious about what was it that, and he even mentions in his comments that he is friends with them because they know him from his past and they, and they took care of him. So again, what did Reese do? What is his dark past that leads into him being friends with them? And again, is he being genuine? Reese, I got my eyes on you. Moving forward, we cut on to Kate, who does have a bit of a heart because we see her taking care of Blue and she wants to help her out in rehab. But then the question is, why does she hide this nice side about her? Very curious on Kate, but I also have a feeling that Kate and Jonathan will have some type of romance going on. But fast forward to Jonathan. He started to think that Malcolm and Nadia may have been in a relationship as he decides to help her out during the absence of Malcolm in her story. So again, I'm a firm believer right now that Nadia, she knows a lot, but she also probably had some type of relationship that might have been consensual with Malcolm. That's where my head's at right now. Let me know if you all are thinking the same. As we wrap up this episode, we got to remember, Jonathan's been distracted this entire episode, so he's kind of lost his track of mind in regards to the race of uncovering the stalker's identity as he returns home to find out that he's lost that game because the stalker has found out Jonathan, or should I say the history of Joe, as he puts it 
all on his wall. He knows exactly who Jonathan is. So episode three titled Eat the Rich. Now to me, this season has gotten better and better. You see the stalker has gotten to Jonathan after exposing his past with these articles for Joe to see exactly what this stalker is capable of, which is simply destroying his life. But more importantly, this individual not only knows where Jonathan lives, but he's actually entered his safe haven and Jonathan must ghost this person to regroup. As now the Eat the Rich killer is born as Malcolm's finger was sent to the London Dispatch with a note that he's been murdered and this is being connected to Simon's murder. So clearly this killer or killers enjoys being in the headlines and seems to be cocky and flashy which probably will work against him but we see this forces Jonathan to play their game and he has their full attention. But the question is, what does this individual or individuals want from Jonathan? They want him to admit that he's Joe and also, why did he kill all those people from his past? This person is willing to blackmail Jonathan and uses Simon's ear attached to Jonathan's name as leverage, which definitely gets Jonathan's attention even more. Now we see Jonathan notices how upset Nadia is after learning of Malcolm's death, which adds more fuel to the fire of them having potentially more than just a professor and student relationship. And it was definitely more intimate than what it seems, which we actually get that confirmation a little bit later. But in the meantime, we see Kate continues to give Jonathan the cold shoulder and sends the police to investigate him. And we know Jonathan doesn't need that particular intention. He is actually quick on his feet lets the police know that Simon was involved and there was a painting fraud situation and he actually brings Blue into the mix and for now it seems to work. As the stalker messages Jonathan that he wants them to do something which is kill Kate. As we finally get the confirmation that Nadia and Malcolm did have a relationship as she is caught at Jonathan's door to find a letter that would expose her. But we know Jonathan's a nice guy. He agrees to help her out and we'll get into that a little bit later. Cut to Jonathan. He attends Malcolm's funeral to see if he can spot the killer and one by one he can't seem to place the killer. But there is a brief moment in which we see a man with long black hair bumps into Jonathan, doesn't say sorry and I think that's something important to remember which we'll get into that ring here in a second but we see after listening to Reese's kind words at Malcolm's funeral and exchanging some words with Vic Jonathan must keep an eye on Kate and tries to continue to get on her good side but strikes out yet again but he must follow her in order to catch this killer who wants her dead we see he manages to share this moment in which Kate isn't being mean and actually shares her childhood and how she was taught and raised to hide her emotions and her feelings, which actually explains why she's been so cold in this season so far. She then goes upon to take him to her favorite spot also, you'll notice that there's someone kind of watching them while all this is going on. The little game of cat and mouse leads to something that I think we all saw coming, full pun intended. We see Kate and Jonathan sleeping together and it appears that the person following them was Vic. Now Jonathan takes his advantage to look for that letter for Nadia, finds the letter but ends up getting caught by Kate in the process and this romance is short lived as she kicks him out but more importantly he did manage to get that letter see the killer takes the opportunity to tell Joe who they think that Joe is as they tell Joe that they believe that he protects those that he loves and he actually enjoys the feeling of killing as we see during this moment that Kate pays a visit to Malcolm as Jonathan listens to her venting which we see Vic follow Jonathan and finds Malcolm's missing ring in his back pocket and they have a bit of a fight which leads to Jonathan defending himself and actually unfortunately killing Vic in the process and we see that he buries Vic next to Simon. So we know that the killer must have been within inches of Jonathan to have planted that ring or maybe Kate when they were sleeping together put the ring in his back pocket. I'm also in the frame of mind that there are, as I've been saying in this review, not just one killer but multiple killers involved. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments below. We see the killer or killers have taken this opportunity to yet again mock Jonathan but this time it actually works as he's starting to crack and messages his back with some not so kind words including that he is determined to ending this person's life but Jonathan catches himself before sending it and notices that this person is lonely and plays into their hand and admits to enjoying killing but will they take the bait 
Meanwhile, Nadia picks up the letter as Jonathan gives her the year of the magical thinking, which is actually a book about a author who lost her husband. And it's also a book that kind of dives into the process of grieving and loss, which would be a perfect book for someone like Nadia who just lost someone to read. Gotta go back to this meeting and the killer takes the bait and wants to meet soon. We end on this episode with Jonathan going to meet Penelope, but we see that the whole crew is there and and not only the crew is there, but the police are there wanting to talk to Jonathan. Episode 4 titled Hamsey. And look, just when your boy thought I might have figured out who the killer or killers might be, this episode might have proved me wrong. So the big question in an episode three was, what do the police want with Jonathan? Well, they're there to talk to someone sober, which is good news for him. As his story matched up involving Blue and the stealing artist situation, as they're now pursuing Simon's past, and they actually want Jonathan to help them in this case. Speaking of Jonathan, he gets the invitation to go into Phoebe's country house in which he accepts in hopes to finding a killer. Now, Jonathan is packing his bag, and now he's watching Kate packing as well. And very interesting moment here with Kate. She's on a phone with with someone trying to set up a meeting with someone that she hasn't spoken to which appears to be years and she doesn't want to speak to them she hangs up the phone and as soon as she does that to me I immediately thought she must have daddy issues which we'll be getting to her dad a little bit later but let's also talk about this moment that we get with Adam and his debt situation with the lenders wanting their money but Adam seems to really not care but I did find his underappreciation of what I assume to be his financial advisor to be interesting because to me this is where my mind is at again me thinking the killer may be fed up with the ways that these rich characters treat their hand that they've been dealt so that was a very interesting scene let's talk about Jonathan who is grabbing his things he's headed off in hopes that when he returns things will be back to what he considers normal now as he arrives he's welcomed by a greeting by Gemma who has a big moment in this episode as well as this passive aggressive compliment by Rold who is on a hunt in this episode. So we see Jonathan learns that there's no service where they're located, which means there's no messages from the killer. And he receives a note to head to the portrait gallery. And he takes his weapon of choice, thinking that he might be meeting the killer officially and hoping to kill them, only to find Phoebe in this sex room with all her toys. Now we have at first this kind of 50 shades of gray situation, but it then quickly returns into a therapy session as Jonathan turns her down she goes ahead and details her relationship problems with Adam but Jonathan eventually cheers her up and promises her that Adam worships her important note this is a prime example of how these characters are so great at pretending we would think from the outside looking in that oh Adam and Phoebe they probably have a good relationship but again they're pretending to be happy which we'll get into Adam's thoughts in a second but we look at how these people treat that are people beneath them as Gemma embarrasses one of the workers and again makes me think that this show is subtly placing these moments like this and these characters like Blue to show us as an audience that maybe the killer was wrong by one of them and at this point they want to take revenge and again keep in mind all these things that Gemma is doing in this episode. So well, here I am thinking that Adam doesn't care about his finances, but to be proven wrong, as he's seeking advice from Jonathan revolving around marrying Phoebe, but not necessarily entirely for love, but knowing that marrying into her family comes with some rules, but also comes with some benefits like being financially stable. These characters cease to have connections. They don't seem to really care for one another, but instead they seem to want to take things from one another as Jonathan learns that Rose was the one that actually invited him and now he's starting to think that he's someone he should keep an eye out for. Speaking of something interesting, as I predicted, Kate and Jonathan couldn't keep their hands off each other, but we see Jonathan at first, he's able to shoot her down to focus on the mission, as we actually get a little bit of backstory between Kate and Roll, their relationship, and all signs right now are pointing towards him being jealous and taking out anyone that affects Kate negatively, but again, knowing that this is episode 4, this can't be the killer, right? It almost seems too easy. As Jonathan sneaks into his room, and he finds these very kind of stark 
stalkerish photos on his camera of Kate. And even if Rold isn't the killer, he is definitely obsessed with her at the very least. Now, I will admit that the whole Rold being jealous of Jonathan and Kate's development in their relationship seems to be a little bit too on the nose for me. But again, thinking about this series, they tend to be on the nose a lot when it comes to the show. But we learn that Rold and Kate go back to the age of 15 and they went to boarding school together, which was in the U.S. We also learned that her mother took her own life and that kind of put Kate on this path to kind of fixing broken people, what she considers to be broken people, which might explain why she's in a relationship with Malcolm and why she's surrounding herself with all these terrible broken people. But I thought this scene was very interesting at the same time. We see that Roll is telling Jonathan how Malcolm and Simon were wrong for her and then he points the gun at Jonathan not knowing that the gun was pointing at him and it almost set the scene up almost as if he was going to shoot him but Kate comes in, almost seems to have saved Jonathan without him even noticing. And again, this goes back to what I said in my last video. I believe that there are two killers involved and that prediction in my maybe rolled is the muscle of the situation and Kate is the brains. Well, as we see in the next scene between the two, that proves to be wrong for the moment because there's definitely signs of him being involved with having bad intentions, but the Kate being the killer isn't online quite yet, which leads us into Jonathan and Kate. They couldn't manage to keep their hands off each other. We do see them hooking up yet again, which I think we all saw that coming, but we fast forward to dinner time and it's time to learn about Kate's lies. As we see Roald and Gemma mention how Jonathan may be the killer, they then shift their energy over to Kate and how she's forgotten she's one of them and mentions her dad and they don't really elaborate and they just stop right there makes me think again that there's something going on with that phone call earlier in the episode and that they might have done something wrong to someone in the past which we will be getting into but this conversation is interrupted because there's a game being set up by phoebe to find the killer and during this game we get the conversation between jonathan and kate in which we learn kate's father who goes by the name of tom lockwood he's an activist investor who's known for killing companies but also he covers up for companies that have done wrong to others and he's considered to be one of the most powerful people as we learn that one of the cover-ups by Tom involved the killing of children who got cancer from some type of water situation and that she hasn't spoken to her dad since she was 20 years old which hints towards that conversation that she was having on the phone earlier so going back on my prediction and my slash theory of someone who might want revenge is starting to make a little sense right maybe her father ruined someone's life and now that this person is taking revenge and taking out members of his family and even friends of that family member let me know your thoughts on that but we see Jonathan is slowly but surely falling in love with Kate now I'm not the biggest fan of the execution of this scene but we see Rold is finding Jonathan and his belongings only to push him out of the window he didn't want to kill him he just wanted to kind of hurt him and he actually did have like a slight injury it looks like but also it seems like his ego was more hurt more than anything Jonathan hears a scream he immediately runs to Kate's room to find Kate with a knife in hand, blood on her hands, and a dead body, and that dead body is Gemma. I want to remind you all, who was the person throughout this episode embarrassing the workers, making fun of the workers? My question is, is that showing us that Kate killed her, or are we going to find out, as again, I haven't seen episode five, that maybe one of the workers did it, and Kate just happened to come in the room and took the knife out of her to help her friend that she really doesn't like? Episode five, which was titled The Fox and the Hound, an episode that finally reveals who the Eat the Rich killer was. Theories, predictions, we're going to talk about it all. With that being said, full spoilers ahead. So the big question ending the fourth episode was after finding Gemma's dead body, is Kate responsible for this? Is Kate the killer? Well, if you ask her, she isn't. But more importantly in this scene, Kate doesn't want to get her father involved because as we find out, Tom Lockwood is someone that does cover ups and he's been trying to reach his daughter for many years. And if he gets involved, he's going to own her. So we see Kate trying to convince Jonathan that she isn't the killer, that she didn't kill Gemma. And then she actually turns the tables on the situation as she starts 
starts to threaten Jonathan that, hey, she can go ahead and tell the others and blame him on the situation. And obviously, he doesn't want that. So they agree to help each other out. They shake hands. He's not going to abandon her. She's not going to end up telling people that he was involved. So they're going to work together, at least for the time being. So we see them two coming up with a plan to get rid of the body. But in comes Phoebe sitting on Gemma's body. And she wants some advice. But they managed to convince her to leave because they want to do some things, some adult things. But she believes them, leaves the room. And their means of taking the body ends up breaking, leaving them to throw in Gemma's body out of the window. And it surprisingly works. As they get rid of the body, time for some truce as Kate puts a knife to Jonathan's throat, thinking that he did it because, hey, he's pretty good at what's happening right now, which surprisingly leads to him telling somewhat of the truth to blame her on the death of Gemma. And someone did the same thing to him in discovering Malcolm's body in his place, which he starts to kind of go into the details of the stalker killer messaging him, as well as he goes into his past with his relationship with love. He also brings Henry into the equation. And of course, us as fans, we know that he's leaving out a lot of details and how that whole story plays out. But the most important thing in this moment is she believes him, but does he believe her? Now, I'm not going to lie, even though I was way more invested in what was going on in Kate and Jonathan at this point in this episode, I did get a good laugh out of Phoebe and Adam, who I think are hilarious in this season, as he tells her his kink and they're trying to work things out, but she ultimately can tell that something's off and he's not really into what's going on. And we all know his kink is the golden showers, but he tells her the reason that this kink isn't working because he always looks at the person doing the action as someone that's beneath him. And as we know, Adam doesn't feel like they're on the same level. So at the moment, she ends things with Adam, but by the end of the episode, they, they get back together. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. But as we see, Adam now wants to take out Jonathan because he told the truth of what his kink was. Meanwhile, Kate mysteriously can't find her bracelet. And if I'm being honest with you all, I thought Kate did that on purpose, but she didn't. But she loses her bracelet, which leads Jonathan to going back to the body. Meanwhile, we cut back to her room where we see that Phoebe is in there and she sees the blood on the rug. And then they have this conversation, which I'm not going to lie. At first, I thought it was kind of lazy writing because surprisingly, Phoebe handles the truth pretty well. And I was thinking to myself, wait, is this kind of a flaw in the story just for the sake of the move forward to get to the ending or was this more of a character development which plays into the idea that these people aren't really friends and they really don't care about each other but we see in the actual scene Phoebe kind of blames it a little bit on the drugs that they took so that's why she's handling this kind of more on the lighter side which I guess is kind of perfect fashion for these type of characters that it kind of plays into one she doesn't really care about Gemma but also two she's kind of high so she really can't really fully understand what's going on. Roald was outside the door listening to it all which means he's headed straight to Jonathan brings us back to this plot of Rold hunting the poor as he has a gun in hand and he's trying to prove to the others that Jonathan is the eat the rich killer. Important to remember that they are also all kind of high off their mind right now. Also they were playing the game of a murder mystery so they're all kind of slightly not taking this seriously but as Rold goes into details he convinces the others that it was Jonathan that killed Malcolm and kind of goes over his reasons. He was also responsible for the death of Simon as well as he is the one that killed Gemma. Now we see Jonathan tries to plead with them, but Rold heard enough and sentences him to death. As we see, Adam attacks Jonathan only to just get knocked out, leaving Jonathan to running, and Rold is on this peasant hunt. All that's happening, we see Kate learns of what's going on. She sends her father's bodyguards to stop this. As we see the hunt taking place, Jonathan, he ends up taking out Roll with ease. And this goes back to my episode four breakdown in which I wondered, where is Reese? So after we see Jonathan knock out Roll, well, surprise, surprise, here is Reese as he knocks out Jonathan and takes him to a secret hiding place. Again, if you go back to my previous breakdown and even in my very first review, I even mentioned that it to me, Reese stood out amongst the others because he didn't seem like he fit in too much, especially comparing the relationship he had with his family and all the stuff he was telling Jonathan in the previous episodes kind of led up to this. But at the same time, I'll be honest with you all, even though I might have predicted it, I also had other predictions that it could have been Kate at one point. It could have been Simon who ended up dying. So I will say I did kind of see this Reese reveal coming and I 
I think there's actually a lot more to that, which we'll talk about in this video. But again, let me know what you all thought of the reveal. Did you think it was Reese? Did you think it was someone else? Let's talk about it in the comments. But go on to the actual breaking down of the scene. We see Reese reveals that this was a part of a project of taking out all these rich people and that he wants Jonathan's methods in blaming the dead and wants Jonathan to kill Roll. Now we see Jonathan continues to kind of play into his hands and plays along with Reese. Back, he wants this job to be done. Why is Reese doing this? Besides them being horrible people, what led Reese down this path? There's a question I have for you all in the comment section. Going into the discussion here, Reese discovered Jonathan hasn't made a move and killing Rold and realizes he's been lying about working together and goes back to square one and the blame on Jonathan and killing Malcolm and leaves both of them to burn alive. See Jonathan gets out of the chains and Roll awakes and wants help, but for a split second there, it almost looked like Jonathan did didn't want to help and if he was he was just going to kill him but again if there's one thing that Reese has given Jonathan as far as advice if you go back to episode one they talked about this road of redemption and redeeming your past mistakes so I think in this moment when we see Jonathan freeing role that that kind of ties into this overarching theme of Joe trying to be a good person even though he's killed many people in the past seasons but at the time we see him saving him and in comes Kate helping them in the process so as we wrap up this this episode we see Gemma's death being reported on the news and yet again the eat the killer has struck again but we also see in this scene that Jonathan's innocence has been confirmed but no messages from his best friend Reese as we wrap up in the final scene we see Kate arriving to Jonathan's house with clothes which I found to be odd which were Malcolm's clothes that he never wore and Jonathan points that out as well she's very thankful for what he was willing to do with the bracelet situation and we see that she wants to kind of go on this path of maybe learning more about each other and maybe falling in love but Jonathan aka Joe smartly declines and his reasons for falling in love again makes a lot of sense for us as the audience obviously he told her in the previous episode that he was married he had a kid but obviously he didn't give her the full breakdown of what he did prior to meeting love but we'll see what comes of that relationship. We end on this scene where we see Reese getting interviewed and we see Jonathan telling us as an audience he has his foot in both worlds, a monster hiding in plain sight. Boy, does that sound familiar to Joe, right? As Joe and him are more alike than Joe realizes, or should I say Jonathan realizes, as Reese has big plans for running for mayor of London. So we're back covering this fourth season, kicking things off with part two, episode six titled best of friends a very interesting episode to kick off this second half and i'm so excited to be back with you all but that being said let's break down this sixth episode full spoilers ahead as we see Jonathan looks in on Reese giving a speech as he continues his campaign as mayor as we see Jonathan is determined at taking him down and he wants to get him alone meanwhile the mysterious woman from part one seen taking photographs of Jonathan makes her return but the question early on for me was who is this lady is she hired by the Quinn family is she maybe a journalist who realized since Jonathan joined this group of people and all of a sudden they're dead and she's trying to figure it all out well Speaking of figuring it all out, we're going to be talking about this character a little bit later. But back to some type of normalcy, we see that Roll tells Kate that he's going to be taking a family trip for a few months. And he invites her, but she declines because she's going to be hosting this event. So to me, Roll being off the table means that the show is trying to probably give Reese more screen time or... Let's continue to think about Roll and what he can be doing. Do you all think he's going to be gone for the entirety of this season or is there something else going on? Let's talk about that in the comment section. Let's talk about some characters that were introduced to and that is a new character by the name of Steve. Now Steve appears to be some type of diamond seller and he's also a car collector as he wants to make a bet with Adam on his engagement with Phoebe. Which speaking of Phoebe, she feels like she's being followed and she's afraid that it's the eat the rich killer as she has a a brief mention of Vic's absence. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all. I have to admit the lack of empathy of him missing just seems so odd to me that she wouldn't be interested in knowing what happened to him. Maybe his family would want to know what happens to him. I'm very curious if they're going to address the absence of Vic, especially after Phoebe gets kidnapped. So let me know if you all think Vic's storyline is just completely dead or is there still some meat on that bone? Let's talk about that in the comment section. As now the whole Nadia suspicions continues for me as she's talking 
talking to Jonathan about researching Reese, and she just conveniently gives him a tip on where Reese likes to jog in the morning. And just like she conveniently gave Jonathan Reese's book back in episode one, I'm telling y'all, I don't think it's a coincidence that she's always having some type of connections with Reese. And we'll talk about Nadia a little bit later. But Jonathan gets his wish as Reese pays him a visit, and he's looking for a friend, and that's Jonathan. Now, Reese goes over his wise for killing as he talks about Malcolm was going to blackmail him for gambling, as we know from the last part. Simon was exploiting women who would have been a bad look for him. And Gemma, she probably just simply would have ruined his image. But Reese lets it slip out. I don't know if you all caught this. He said that he was once married in the past. So my question for you all, who's his ex-wife? And I wonder if Joe is going to look into this and maybe expose him for his past. So that's something we're going to keep an eye out for. And remember in the future episodes, will we find out who Reese used to be married to? Now we see Reese claims to care for Joe because they have a lot in common as he gives him a chance to make up for not framing role in the finale of part one. Joe must find someone to place the blame on and he has to do it. And if he doesn't, he's going to end up being the fall guy. Now I got a tip for Joe. I think it'll be smart for him to start carrying a voice recorder or a tape recorder next time he's going to meet with Reese to have some leverage. I think that would be a good idea, right? But our mysterious photographer, we see that she manages to get hired on Kate's staff for this event as Phoebe spills the beans on her friends as Joe searches for a way in to find someone to put the blame on and the person gets brought up and that is Connie who appears to be his first option because Connie doesn't have an alibi. So that leads us into meeting another character here by the name of Nico who is a single man who's immediately flirting with Kate and he also has some daddy issues as we see Joe watches his interaction. Going back to Joe, he sets his sight on Connie and they have a meeting and we see Connie tells him that the police are indeed investigating him and Connie actually wants help from Joe and we see Joe starting to kind of feed into his pity party just a little bit and he's starting to feel a little bit guilty and this is where he gets the message from Reese that he applies the pressure on Joe and he tells him that he has 24 hours to get this done and just to put a little bit more pep in his step, he puts Simon Ear in his own freezer. Man, I'm telling you all, Reese is 10 steps ahead of Joe at this point. But we head to the event where we see Nadia and Edward are in attendance and they're all of a sudden dating. Yet again, conveniently, we see Nadia at this party for the rich and we know Edward comes for money. I have a feeling that she is the second killer. My whole theory that she might be involved, I also think the reason she might be there is because she might be spying on Joe to see if he actually completes his assignment. We see Joe meditating with Connie who's attending rehab soon. We see Joe's tries to plant the ear in his pocket, but he kind of misses that window of opportunity. Meanwhile, our mysterious woman gathers Phoebe and takes her to a safe room by the orders of the police. As we see, Nadia tries to take a selfie with Phoebe, but she notices something's off and she warns Joe. Now we finally get the name of the mysterious woman and her name is Dawn as she locks Phoebe in the room and reveals herself as a friend and she wants to take care of her and we can tell right off the bat that she's seamlessly just a stalker that's obsessed and she's a big fan of Phoebe. She's got a tattoo on her arm because she seems to think that she's her soul sister. She pulls out a knife and we see that Phoebe is just straight up frightened as Dawn knows everything about her. She even goes on to spill the beans about Adam's debt and him being and unfaithful to Phoebe. Now, cutting back to Joe, we know that he's a stalker himself. He manages to find the room that she has Phoebe in. As we see, Dawn inevitably lets him in, but then Dawn realizes that she knows who he is because she's been taking the photos of him and she's convinced that he's a con man as we have this very, very interesting moment with Joe. As Joe has to look in the mirror and it seamlessly he's talking to himself as he's talking to Dawn that she's created this imaginary relationship relationship with Phoebe and this has all been an illusion created in her head kind of tying to you guys' thoughts on Reese here. But as we know, Joe has done this since season one with Beck and others. So he's a pretty bunch of an expert at kind of creating these different fantasy relationships. As eventually the police find them, we see that Joe actually managed to put Simon's ear in her bag and seamlessly mission complete. But we see Nadia is watching all this take place. She seems to be concerned. We cut to the next day and we see Dawn is now being officially coined as the actual 
actual killer. And we see this conversation taking place between Nadia as she tells Edward about her suspicions about Jonathan and his connections to always saving Phoebe. So maybe my theory might be off with Nadia, but we'll see where all this comes. But we wrap up this sixth episode with Adam proposing to Phoebe, but she refuses after Dawn gave her all the information about his debt. So she gives him an ultimatum. Adam, I'll come back with you as long as you take care of your finances alone. So we'll see what comes of that relationship, this new part. As we cut over to Kate and Nico, as they begin to hook up and she notices that a message comes through on his phone from her own father. And she's easily able to put the pieces together that he actually works for her father and that her father was actually the one that purchased all the arts from her event. She kicks him out, but I still think we're going to probably get more of Nico because it seems like her father's going to be a big character in this second part. But she kicks him out to invite our boy Joe over. So we have these two people escaping and running away from their past as Kate vows to never question Joe's past and he's going to do the same for her and they are going to try to make this thing work. And we know as an audience, Joe has a weakness and it is falling in love and it looks like he's officially head over heels for Kate, which we know will not be a good thing. But ending up this episode, Reese yet again breaks into Joe's house to celebrate, but he also can't overlook him labeling Dawn as erotomania, which in definition is a form of delusion disorder in which an individual believes that another person, usually of higher status, is in love with them. Could Joe be suffering from this same thing? Going back to you all's Reese theories, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. So I think it's very plausible, if I'm being honest with you all. But as he's there, he's talking about what's next for him and his new best friend, Joe, and it is the biggest and greatest main event, and that is to take out and kill Kate Father, the devil, together as best friends. So, episode 7, titled Good Man, Cruel World. Spoilers ahead. As Jonathan and Kate officially go on an actual date, we see Joe gets to know the real her. She's a kind person. She listens. And they have this moment in which they have this pretend future together in which they want to have a house. They want to have kids. And I don't think we've seen Kate smile as much as she's doing in this exact scene. But, you know, I can't seem to shake this feeling. I know her and Malcolm weren't on the best of terms in their relationship, but still, that was her boyfriend for several years, and he was recently murdered. She is just moving on so quickly. It seems so odd to me. Now, I don't know if this is a character flaw. Is this just a result of how she was raised and not really have feelings? I don't know, y'all. Let me know what you all think about Kate just moving on so quickly in the comments below. As we see the conversation between Joe and Reese talking about killing Tom Lockwood, Reese tells him he he promises this is the last favor and if he does this joe will be able to balance the scales and essentially atone for his sins now as this was going on i was thinking to myself in reality he's just really using joe as his personal hitman and if reese is to be a real individual what does tom lockwood have over him We'll be talking about that a little bit later. Now, Joe manages to invite himself to going with Kate and meeting her father in order to begin the process of trying to find a way to maybe not kill her father. Meanwhile, Nadia is researching about the Eat the Rich killer and feels Dawn being the killer is just way too easy and her conspiracy theory about Joe being involved begins. Speaking of Joe, he's doing his own research on Tom Lockwood as it appears he's managed to wipe all the evidence of his past wrongdoings off the entire internet. Back with Nadia, she catches Joe in a lie as he's dodging questions about him reading her stories after she tried to get some answers out of him about what happened the night of dawn. I'm really enjoying how much Nadia is kind of picking at Joe, but we all know if someone digs too deep in Joe, they end up six feet under. So I'm kind of scared for Nadia, and we'll talk about what happens to her a little bit later in this episode, as it is time to officially meet Tom, played by Greg Kinnear, and immediately this character has my full attention after he shakes the hand of Jonathan, he tells him the following, I look forward to getting to know you, Joe. How the hell does he already know who he is? And all this is going on. We're only 10 minutes into this fantastic episode. Now, four courses into their meal, Joe has no idea what Tom has over Reese, but more importantly, what does he know about Joe? As dessert arrives in the form of a museum structure, as Tom offers Kate this museum for her to run on her own, and it will be called the Lockwood Museum, located in New York City. Now, this is clearly 
really overwhelming for Kate, who has to think about taking up this offer as she goes to the restroom, leaving Joe and Tom alone. Now, Tom takes this opportunity and cuts straight to the chase. What can you tell me about Love Quinn? And did you kill her or did you kill anyone of that matter? We see Joe manages to dodge the heat temporarily as Tom reminds him to not hurt Kate or else he'll meet the real Tom. Now, if I'm in Joe's position, I'm not messing around with Tom. He seems to be someone that you don't want to ruffle their feathers. But more interesting is Tom brings Reese up in the conversation as he's in Kate's circle and he wants Joe to tell him about Reese. Now, as it appears, Reese is a threat to Tom because of the book he has coming out soon and maybe whatever he's going to put in this book could be damaging to the political career that Tom wants to pursue. We see Tom uses this as leverage. If Joe can get dirt on him, he'll be grateful, aka Tom won't expose Joe and he'll protect him as Joe will use Tom to put Reese in prison. This is shaping up to be very, very interesting. So I assume based on Tom and his status that he probably had a team of researchers looking up Jonathan, aka Joe's past to find all this information. Or is it possible that Tom Lockwood has some personal connections to the Quinn family? Let me know your thoughts on all that. Meanwhile, we see Phoebe is staying with Kate after the recent Dawn situation, and she may be suffering from PTSD after not only that, but all the stuff that's recently happened. Kate suggests that she seeks help, and she agrees to do so. In comes Adam, who's in the process of losing everything. He convinces Kate to allow him to take Phoebe to the hospital. Now, this plot has to be more significant, right? Because I don't think it's just face value in regards to just seeing this toxic relationship with these two broken people. I'm very curious to see where this goes, but I still have my thoughts that Phoebe isn't as innocent as she plays out to be. Let me know where you all think this particular plot is headed. As Joe baits Reese into coming over, and my suggestion that I said in my last breakdown that Joe should record their conversation, he actually does that. Now, literally within seconds, we see Reese realizes that he's being recorded almost like he saw it coming. But again, before the major reveal in this moment, I'm saying to myself, okay, how the hell did he know he was being recorded? Does he have cameras in Joe place? There's no way he would have known that. But again, he knows that because it's actually Joe that we'll talk about. But back to the actual scene. Another plot point that I mentioned in my last breakdown was what's going to happen with Marianne? Well, we see Reese pulls out her passport and he's actually taking her hostage in a if Joe doesn't kill Lockwood in 24 hours, she's going to end up dead. This episode is getting better and better as it goes on. As we cut to the next morning, Joe sees the smear campaign from Tom on Reese has begun. As Kate arrives and she tells him some truths. When Kate was 19, she was the one that was actually responsible for those kids getting cancer. It wasn't eating her alive as she claims that she's actually worse than her father. We see Joe doesn't even bat an eye and he accepts her even after hearing this news. I guess they're just both terrible people that's done terrible terrible things and they seem to be a perfect match right but i'm very curious on what else has kate done in her past that she might be hiding so the clock is ticking and joe meets with tom and he manages to get him alone to talk about reese in this private room with no cameras now joe proceeds to follow along with potentially killing him but we see tom finds a way to get in his head by bringing up reese but it doesn't stop there as tom flat out says that he knows that joe killed love quinn and he doesn't really care the the point is he did it and he managed to get away with it. He talks about his plans to take Reese down. He has begun with this plan by forcing him into hiding with his ex-wife. Tom switches the whole game plan and he wants Joe to kill Reese and he tells him that he will be his best self. Okay, Tom is evil and despicable as hell, y'all, but what a great character so far, and he's had so little screen time so far, but he's caused so much damage. I am really enjoying this character, how he's written so far, but back with Kate, she learns that not only did Phoebe not go seek help, but she's now engaged to Adam again. I'm just so curious to see where they're going to actually take their storyline. Meanwhile, Nadia gets her locksmith relative to break into Joe's house in hopes to finding something on him which she does and she finds a key hidden in the book we see edward also helps her by sending her photos taken by dawn in which nadia notices joe's secret lair which happened to be introduced earlier in this episode it was across the street from where we saw kate and joe eating indian food 
Back to Joe, he goes to Reese hideout, which we get a brief scene between Reese and his ex-wife, whose name was Emma. They're getting into a fight. She drives off, which leads Joe to knocking Reese out. But right before he knocks out Reese, Reese appeared to not have any idea who Joe was. We cut to the scene and seeing Reese tied up and completely helpless, Joe takes extreme measures to find a location to marry Ann, and those measures are extremely painful, but again, Reese has no idea what Joe is talking about. In full on marriage mode, we see Joe chokes Reese and actually kills him, and in comes Reese. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, it appears that Joe has made him up all in his head to become less of a psychopath. So pat yourself on the back right now if you were one of those people that thought that Reese was made up in Joe's head because, hey, you were right. Back to Nadia and Joe's secret lair. She uses the key. She finds Marianne. And we got the return of Joe's secret hiding cage part two, episode eight, titled Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? And full spoilers ahead. Now, for those that aren't too familiar with this title, it comes from Joyce Carol Oates in a form of short stories, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? As it tells the story of this young lady's journey to find her own identity. Along the way, she uses her beauty to create in her mind a feeling of maturity, which ultimately becomes her downfall. Now, interestingly enough, I think that there's connections with that title and paralleling to what's going on with Joe, as he has created these stories in his head, and it might end up being his downfall. So I think it's a very effective way to use this title. As we open the episode with a flashback of hearing Marianne's voiceover as she's in Paris with her daughter right before she has to go to the art fair and we see what really happened to her from her perspective of when Joe took her. As we cut to an apartment where Joe is holding her as he studies a video of Reese as we haven't seen this side of Joe in a very long time. I mean, he is cold, he is calculus, and he's really not present as this reminds us all as an audience of how evil and how dangerous Joe really is. And just taking a brief moment here, honestly, this show has done such a masterful job of tricking us with Joe's charm because we have sometimes forgot that he is the real villain of this series. Now, we get a bit of insight on the question that I posed in my last video. Why did Joe choose Reese? As Joe tells Marianne that Reese used to have a dark past, but as time went by, he made a change. And within that change, he became everyone's favorite hero and people want him to run for mayor and that inspired Joe. So it's starting to make sense on why Joe would choose someone like this, someone one that had a dark past but all of a sudden made a needed change and now he had changed has helped him become the hero and I think it's safe to say that Joe wants to do the same thing. As Joe continues to stalk up and study up on Reese and keep Marianne hostage, we see her attempt to escape before being kept in his cage, but she ultimately fails and breaks her arm in the process. In this moment, as she pleads with Joe to set her free, we see Joe completely blanking out and talking to himself and bangs his head against the cage as he reveals that he's not Joe and he has this creepy, dark, sinister smile on his face. Listen, I think Joe is too far gone to ever make a return to some type of normal We'll see. There's even the moment where we see Joe dropping off food and also painkillers to maybe help out her healing her arm. And a lot of us might think, well, maybe there's a little bit of kindness left in Joe. I don't think so. I think we're seeing the dark side of Joe really taking over. And I think that that gesture was really kind of a dark gesture because Joe knows that she used to be a drug addict and she would probably relapse if she took those pills. So I think this is just showing us an example of how dark and how far gone he is from being that nice Joe that we thought he was at one point. Now, as this is happening, this story is kind of being told from the perspective of Marianne as she's reading this Nightingale story to her daughter. And personally, as we get this non-linear storytelling to convey her emotions, it really worked for me. But let me know in the comments what you all thought of the storytelling method. See her trying to kill Joe with kindness only for whatever this persona that he's created inside of his head tells her that Joe is not here and that she's being kept here until he finally comes comes back to kill her. I'm going to tell y'all something right now. I was so impressed by these performances by both actors. This episode was just so great for me so far. Let me know where you all were at in this point in the episode as we get this montage of a day after day where we see her doing the same routine with her broken arm, but she's not broken as she fights to stay strong to see her daughter again, but she starts to realize that the food is running low and she ultimately snaps and she starts to lose it, which is understandable as it's in this moment that Nadia finds her from the last episode. 
Cut to Joe, who's told by his made-up version of Reese that this has been brewing for a long time in his head. Now, we see a shift in the Reese made-up version has kind of changed as he's trying to do something for Joe in this episode, which is help him remember that he hasn't been checking in on Marianne. Now, Joe, who is just in full denial, he doesn't think he's crazy. He actually tries to prove it to himself as he replays his hidden camera footage, only showing that he was talking to himself when he met with Reese last. And then we get the flashback of all the times in part one of him talking to himself and not Reese. The only time Reese was actually present is when he was at the funeral, when he acknowledged Joe was there only to just nod at him. And also every time he was on camera, seeing on the television perspective, that was the real version of Reese. And every other time was just simply made up in Joe's head. As we see Joe trying to justify the killings of what he did in the first half of this season. So I guess it's safe to say that my second killer theories can be thrown out of the window as it's time for Joe to know who he really is in order to find Marianne. Back to Nadia and Marianne. Nadia is being told by Marianne to not get the police involved because Joe will find a way out. And I can't lie, I don't think that's the best decision, but she does make a point that every time Joe gets involved with the police, he finds a way to trick them out of the situation every single time. Now, the plan is for Nadia to return soon with an actual plan, but meanwhile, she must not get caught by Joe. Marianne seems to hope that this plan will work. We get this brief scene in which we see Kate and Joe having a conversation discussing Adam and Phoebe's engagement party as we cut to Nadia in class with Joe and she's kind of making it abundantly clear that there's something that's throwing her off and we see that the Reese actually notices this. But Joe believes that this is just an issue that she's having with her boyfriend and I think again Nadia has become one of my favorite characters as this second part is going on because she's so smart in these situations. As we cut to seeing Kate trying to convince Phoebe to forget about this engagement party and seek out the help that she needs, it was in this scene that it finally hit me as far as the question I've been asking, what is the importance of Phoebe and Adam? Don't get me wrong, I enjoy these characters. They bring a lot of levity into this dark show sometimes, but a lot of times when we cut to them, it kind of feels unnecessary. But I'm looking at Phoebe here, taking a step back and looking at this character. She's a prime example of what happens when we suppress our emotions and our feelings and we create these fairy tales that everything is fine by focusing on others and not helping ourselves and she's doing the same thing with Adam she's trying to fix him and trying to help him through his problems and we can parallel that to what's going on with Joe Joe is a broken individual but he'll rather ignore his mental health issues and he inserts himself in everyone else's lives so I think that and plus I think that there will be some more meat to what's going on with Phoebe and Adam and I wouldn't be surprised if Adam ends up being killed by Joe but the kind of deep deeper meaning of this character is the idea of what happens when you ignore your true issues and trying to help other people, you forget to help yourself. So let me know your thoughts on that in the comments below, or if you think there's a different point of that particular plot, let's talk about that in the comment section. Back with Joe, who's torn his apartment to pieces in order to find a clue where he can find Marianne, but has no luck, as Reese gives him a tip, which is looking into his Jekyll and Hyde book, which I think is hilarious, where we see Nadia has placed a key back there, but also he finds the notes that he took obsessing over Reese, and we get the return of the box that we see for the first time this season with all his handy dandy souvenirs, but more importantly, he finds a map with the location of Marianne. We end this episode with Joe getting closer and warmer to location as Nadia has also arrived as promised. Now the plan that Nadia comes up with isn't revealed to us as an audience as we see Joe slowly starting to remember what he's done as he enters the lair and we fade to black. Episode 9 titled She's Not There, an episode directed by the one and only Joe himself, Pin Badgley. Full spoilers ahead. As Joe appears to be frightened of what he's done, we see Nadia and Marianne have come up with a plan that we don't hear about as we see Joe enters the room downstairs as Nadia hides. The more level-headed Joe is present and we can see that Marianne notices this as Joe promises to fix himself and tells her he's going to fix everything as she's begging for him to let her go, but he has to leave, but first thing in the morning he promises he'll return with a plan. We see Nadia believes that the best plan at hand is to actually 
kill Joe as Nadia will get the drugs to knock him out and get a drill to set her free, but more importantly, get a knife to finish him. Meanwhile, at the engagement party, we see Kate overhears Adam's bet with Steve as Kate shares what she's heard with Phoebe and tries to get through to her and brings up how people like Adam take advantage of her, but Phoebe doesn't want to hear any of this. Back at Joe's place, we see evil Reese is distracting him as he attempts to come up with a plan, but Reese has a surprise for Joe in the freezer and it's a gun to kill Marianne. But we see Joe refuses to use his gun to do so and kill Marianne as Joe seems to think he's got a plan and it involves saving her and saying goodbye to Kate. We see Joe wants to play hero one last time and helping Kate save her best friend and they work together in doing so. Joe talks to Phoebe and uses reverse psychology on her and it starts to work but Adam arrives just in time. I gotta say I much more preferred the part one versions of both characters Adam and Phoebe because in this second part both of their characters seem so one dimensional and Adam went from being the second in line in this relationship to fully controlling every move that Phoebe makes to me it just feels so rushed and underdeveloped let me know if you all feel the same thing in regards to the change of these characters in the comments below now we see the mission has failed. As they've arrived to her place, Joe speaks from the heart and telling Kate that he thanks her for making him a changed man. He manages to keep his composure and not go upstairs with her and promises to call her first thing in the morning, but first he has to take care of a few things. While this is happening, Phoebe unfortunately makes a terrible decision in marrying Adam and you can see the look on her face of disappointment and regret as she takes a moment to herself to have a mental breakdown. As Joe heads over to tell Mary Ann that he's got a plan and he agrees to check in on her daughter only to find out that her sudden departure has caused her to lose custody of her child. After hearing the news, Mary Ann would rather die than not be with her daughter as we see Joe just continues to ruin her life. As Nadia rushes to get back to Marianne with all the supplies she needs, she unfortunately drops all her belongings in front of an officer who sees the knife and wants to question her. Meanwhile, Joe, having heard enough of his evil side about killing Marianne, he decides to take tranquilizer pills that Kate found at Phoebe's engagement party in order to fall asleep and wake up in the next morning. As it appears that Joe is ready to free Marianne, but there is one problem. Joe arrives and he can't remember the code, and also it appears that he might have put something in her drink that is killing her which causes him to go into a panic as he pays a visit in his inner thoughts and we arrive back to his home to find Gemma there. As we watch this inner battle between Joe and his dark past, Gemma mocks him for not willing to do what needs to be done, which leads him to another location, and that is the return of season one you, and that is Beck. Before we talk about this conversation between Joe and Beck, I gotta admit, having Jim in there felt a little bit out of place. Number one, they didn't spend that much time together, and also, it seems like this part of his brain is involving all the women he fell in love with and hurt, so I thought it would have been more perfect for Delilah to be there versus Gemma Either way, as I digress, we have the scene with Beck and Joe as she reminds him of what he took away from her and tells him how he's never saved anyone as she swallows the key that he needs to free Marianne, which leads him to finding his next victim, the one and only woman who matches energy and my personal favorite ex of his, love. We, us, are love language as we see love telling Joe his pattern and never taking any responsibility, she questions if he ever ever truly love these women and we see love places the gun in his hand and proceeds to shoot him simply implying what he needs to do and that is ending his terror of pain and suffering Joe must end as this was all a dream happening so I gotta say even though I'm not the biggest Beck fan from season one I did like her presence in this scene and I know she appeared in season two as well but I do think she fit well in this moment here I love the character love and I knew when we saw her in a trailer that it wasn't going to be her showing that she's alive and she's back for revenge that it was going to be a part of joe having a hallucination but regardless she's so fantastic she ate up that scene my only issue with this scene was again i wish they would have substitute having jim in there and maybe replacing her with delilah even hell having candace pop up in that moment seemed to be a better fit than Gemma. but let me know your thoughts on those cameos in the comments below as joe awakes and we see reese tries to stop him but it doesn't work as joe heads back to marianne as we cut to seeing Adam thinking he's living his 
best life with his sexual partners only to see that they have been hired by someone else and that is Tom. As we end this episode, we learn that Tom actually had Adam killed, which I figured was going to be the case for Adam, but I thought it was going to be at the hands of Joe. Kate can't believe what he's done and says that this is the last time he'll be seeing her, but Tom, he isn't having it. He reveals that all the things Kate believes she made up on her own were all actually because of him, all behind the scenes. Even this sexual harassment case that Malcolm was involved with that she didn't know about, he took care of that. So we see Tom telling her that she is his favorite child out of the seven kids that he has, and he tells her that he owns everything in this world, including Kate, leaving her in pure shock. So the question is, will Kate end up taking this offer or will she go a step further and actually kill her father in order to escape him? Let me know your thoughts on that in the comment section. As Nadia makes it out of jail and runs to go to Marianne, meanwhile, Joe arrives to find that she's taken the pills and she's on the verge of dying. Fourth season of You, part two, explaining the ending of the finale, episode 10, which was titled The Death of Jonathan Moore. A very fitting title for this finale as we see the rebirth of Joe Goldberg. We get into it. I want to thank every single one of you all that's been watching this series of reviews in which I broke down each episode of this fourth season. I really appreciate the support. With that being said, we got an episode to break down. Full spoilers ahead. He opened with Joe burning a letter left behind by Mary Ann requesting him to leaving her where she can be found so that her daughter won't have to suffer thinking her mother is still out there alive, which is very important for a little bit later on. We see Joe places her body on this bench. Fast forwarding to the next day, in class we see the students discover that Reese's body was found in the woods and Joe is very surprised. Cut to seeing Nadia apologizing to Edward about her recent behavior as she shows him an article about Love Quinn's death involving Joe. Now Nadia takes Edward to Joe's secret location to prove her point as the cage is now gone. Edward claims to believe her as they plan to take down Joe together. Back home with Joe, he begins to write his letter explaining his crimes as he plans to end it all. We see Reese tells him that he's wasted his time because Tom Lockwood is coming for him, but this conversation is cut short because Kate messages Joe that she needs him because this is an emergency. Kate tells him she planned on skipping town, but proceeds to go ahead and telling him about a time when she was younger and when she discovered that her father was just so obsessed and so controlling about everything in her life that he actually hired someone to follow her everywhere she went in a form of some type of protection. We see that she tells Joe about what happened when she spoke to her father last and questions if Joe was even hired by him. Now, we see at this point, as I stated in my previous breakdown, it was just a matter of time after hearing Kate tell him how her father owns her, we see Joe getting ready to do what he does best and that's setting his sight on killing Tom Lockwood. But first, Joe must confront his inner self as he's having a conversation with Reese and we see them having this conversation about potentially coming to an agreement about how this relationship will be working moving forward as he suggests that they should integrate as we see the plan is set in motion to kill Tom Lockwood. We get a quick scene first as we see Edward gives Nadia a USB with everything about the Eat the Rich Killer and Reese as this will help build the case against Joe, which will end up going against Edward a little bit later on. We see Joe manages to sneak into Tom's hangar but misses the opportunity to knock him out, so he has to make up a quick story on why he's here. As we see Joe goes on about his concerns about the discovery of Reese's body, as Tom goes to reach for his phone to relieve Joe of his worries, we see that he turns turns his back to Joe, which allows Joe to take him down. Now we see Tom doesn't beg for his life, but instead he tries to get into Joe's head by telling Joe that Kate doesn't really care about him and he always has been there to protect her. Now the conversation is abruptly ended as Tom's bodyguard arrives, forcing Joe to actually killing him. Now we see Tom showing some concern for his life after seeing what Joe is capable of as he offers Joe a clean slate and a fresh start by making him extremely rich and saving Joe, but we see Joe doesn't take the bait as Tom makes his final plea by saying he and Joe are two of the same as they're trying to protect Kate at all costs, but Joe has heard enough and he kills Tom Lockwood. Now Joe takes his next steps in making it seem as though Tom's bodyguard Hugo is responsible for killing him because Joe finds out that Hugo has some financial issues and those issues are made to believe that Hugo end up robbing and eventually killing Tom. This leaves Joe with one task left, which is ending himself. 
We see Joe's inner Reese is making a final case of keeping Joe alive as Kate gives him a call, but Joe throws his phone away because he believes it's inevitable that she'll end up dead like the others. Now, Joe confronts himself about how much he hates and despises this darkness inside of him. Joe thanks himself by throwing Reese over the bridge and necks himself. As we see him replaying his moments with Kate and other moments of him experiencing falling in love, we see him diving deeper and deeper into the depths of the water and in it appears that Joe Goldberg is gone forever. Back with Nadia and Edward, she tells him something that he must never tell and the reason why she must stop Joe. We cut back to the conversation between Nadia and Mary Ann in episode 9 in which they come up with their plan of killing Joe and as I predicted in my last video, those pills were all a part of the plan but the part that caught me off guard was finding out that the whole setup of her losing her daughter was also a part of the plan so I gotta say, it was a pretty good plan by those two. We cut to Nadia waking up Marianne after Joe left her on the bench as she's safe and Joe believes she's dead. But Nadia is still worried about Joe as her and Edward head to his flat to discover the last pieces of the evidence to put him away for good. We cut to a hospital bed to find Joe is still alive. He was found by the police and believed to have accidentally fallen off the bridge as Kate arrives. Now Joe doesn't want to start off by lying and he tells her he didn't fall and he doesn't stop there, he tells her that he's killed people. As we see Kate is aware about who killed Reese and being that her father got Joe involved to have this done, as we find out that she is now taking the responsibility of being the CEO of the company, Kate believes Joe is good and offers him a deal of keeping each other good for the remaining of their lives. He is truly a Lockwood. Joe might have found someone that actually loves him as Joe tells her everything from the start and he starts by telling her his actual name. So Kate now officially knows all his secrets, but my question is, has she told him everything as well? Back with Nadia and Edward, she searches in Joe's belongings and discovers his box of souvenirs and takes a picture of it all. He heads back to Edward and she can't seem to find him and Joe has arrived. So I guess the hospital let Joe out early because Kate's new status of power as we see Joe is cool, calm, and collected. He takes Nadia's phone and deletes the pictures she took as Joe tells her she's not in danger because his situation has changed because he now has unlimited resources and offers her a way to make this work for everybody. Now we end the episode with meeting the new owners of Adam's old club, which is Blessing and Sophia. We see that Rold has returned from his vacation, as well as Connie is back from rehab, and these people are still terrible individuals. Meanwhile, we see that Phoebe is teaching children English in Thailand, and she appears to be happy. We cut to seeing Mary Ann and her daughter are safe and happy back in Paris, as she reads an article on her phone about Joe and Kate being happy and celebrating their second chance chances in life and if you notice in this scene she seems to be a little bit upset and rightfully so and we'll talk about her in a little bit here as we see the freshly shaved Joe and Kate are being interviewed back home in New York City at the Lockwood Museum about the tragic past of Love Quinn and seeing that Joe had faked his own death but with Tom's previous publicist Cynthia they managed to dodge the important questions that many have as we see exactly how Joe Joe managed to keep Nadia quiet. We cut back to that scene where we see Joe actually killed Edward and we see that Nadia was in shock and she takes the knife that Joe used to kill Edward and you'll notice that it appears that Joe has officially accepted his dark side as he puts everything in motion to make it seem as though Edward was the one responsible for Reese's death because of that USB drive that he showed earlier in the episode and says that Nadia killed him. As Joe tells her how smart she is and he's looking forward to seeing how she's going to find her way out of this situation. We see Joe walks away and he explains that Nadia remains silent in prison. As we wrap up our final scene, we see our last shot of Joe back in New York looking back at himself and we see Reese in the mirror smiling back at him. The plan for this new power couple is to change the world and if killing is needed, it's much easier this time around because Joe is now honest with himself about everything that he does. So we see that Joe would rather die than take responsibility of his actions and he's been officially reborn and has all the tools at his disposal and escapes again as he's now accepted who he really is which to me means that 
all these innocent people in the future will die. So the question is, what next? I would imagine if there is to be a season five, which as I'm recording this, there has been no official announcement, but I would bet my money that we would see all those he left behind and alive and has damaged their lives will be seeking revenge on Joe. And you might be asking, well, who are those people? Well, starting off with the Quinn family, who were led to believe that the hitman they hired in the season killed Joe. So I bet they will be seeking some type of vengeance and also seeking their justice for their daughter as well as 40. And you can't forget about Ellie, whose sister Delilah was killed by love back in season two. And if you all do not know, Jenna Ortega was supposed to be in this new season of You, but due to scheduling issues with shooting Wednesday, she wasn't able to. So I would bet that she will be a part of a season five. And I also believe even though she's safe with her daughter in Paris, Marianne would want revenge once she finds out that the person that saved her is in prison, which is Nadia. And I wouldn't be surprised if Nadia is a part of this plan, but also she might recruit Dawn, who by all means was a stalker in her own right, but we know that Joe framed her for murder. So she's going to probably have some vengeance as well. Also, you can't forget that Edward's mom runs the newspaper, so she may be seeking vengeance because she knows her son isn't capable of murder and he has no reason to have killed Reese. And also, I gotta say, I wouldn't be surprised if Rold won't be jealous of this new love between Kate and Joe and may want to help as well. But I do think to me it would be more fitting if all the women that Joe has affected would be the one taking charge. So overall, I thought this season did a really good job of showing us characters that would rather die or rather sell someone out than take any responsibility for their actions. Also, we saw on full display all the privileges that money can buy people of power. This show manages to continue to show us Joe taking down what he considers to be terrible people, which they are, whether you think about Malcolm or Simon or Gemma and even Tom Lockwood of that matter. He takes these people down and there's some sense of poetic justice in doing so, but the show doesn't forget to show us that Joe is still the worst of them all. And he's now found Kate, who in some ways is probably more evil and bad than he is because she allows this stuff to happen. Now, Kate has known of all the cover-ups and the murders that her father committed, and she did nothing, and she was responsible for those kids getting cancer, and she took no responsibility. So, this is a very good theme that I think the show is really displaying, is again, these privileges and how people don't take any responsibility for any of their actions. Now, while I did enjoy part one, I thought part two was the better half. Now, I thought the story was richer, the suspense was better, and the performances, man, Penn Badgley's performance was great. He was great in part one but he was phenomenal in the second half and shout out to him for directing his first episode of this series and speaking of phenomenal Tati Gabrielle was absolutely great I love that they brought her story back into the mix and I do think she will be a part in season five as I had mentioned earlier but man think about episode eight and how incredible she was in that moment and in those scenes and I can't leave out shouting out Ed Spellers who played Reese in this season he was stellar as well so for those that are watching those are my thoughts on the entirety of season four on this finale and i want to thank you all for watching this video and for those who watch all five breakdowns for part two put in the comments right now five for five thank you so much for the support and for those that watch all 10 of my breakdowns for every single episode of this fourth season put in the comments right now 10 for 10 and you my friends are the best and are the real mvps i really appreciate y'all so leave your thoughts in the comments comments on part two on this finale of season four which part did you enjoy more and of course share your predictions and your theories about what you all hope to see in a part five or i should say season five i'll be making some short form content for my rankings of the season of you and i'll have some other videos that you all can keep an eye out for for this show stay tuned for that before you all leave just a friendly reminder if you enjoyed today's content make sure you all are hitting that thumbs up sharing this video leaving your thoughts in the comments so Subscribe by clicking right here. Check out my latest video and check out my playlist for all my you breakdowns. You all are great. Stay safe and I'll see you all on the next breakdown.